morning, everyone. I think we're right on time. We can start. So my name is Maciej Maciejewski. My friend Krzysztof is sitting next. He will be hosting a different session later today. So uh, let me drive this one. Uh, with persistent memory, I will try to explain what it is actually uh, that we're talking about, how we can see it in Linux or actually other operating systems as well. Uh, what it is good for, so how we can actually use it. And then the, the most um, nice things around it, I will be showing uh, what are the outcomes of using it. So what kind of uh, benefits can your applications expect? Not really the Linux kernel yet, because we um, haven't started to modify the kernel. It's uh, probably years effort to actually make it work on persistent memory, but uh, we are already doing some work around the applications to convert them and see uh, is it good, is it bad, what kind of benefits we can uh, possibly have with it. So persistent memory. Uh, we all know how DIM looks like, right? DIM form factor, small piece that goes to the motherboard. Normally it hosts uh, DRAM memory. Uh, in this case, uh, we are talking about DRAM-like chips that can also retain the data upon power cycles. So if your machine goes out, crashes, whatever happens, you take uh, the DIM out, non-volatile DIM, and it contains all your data there. It doesn't lose anything. And um, actually, hardware like this is already on the market since some time. Um, thing with it that it's mostly based on the regular DRAM plus battery, plus flash, some logic to dump the data. And therefore, it's actually more pricey than the regular DRAM. And number of use cases is very limited because of it. Some really specialized uh, software or use cases that uh, can utilize it. Uh, for the uh, why we are taking um, another look at it, uh, is actually the announce announcement we have made as Intel last year. And this is my last marketing slide, first and last. Uh, with the new type of materials that can give you actually the latencies close to DRAM and capacity which is much higher than DRAM and can fit perfectly in this idea of having non-volatile DIM. And uh, when we are talking about capacity, out of one socket, so one CPU, normally with DRAM you can get like half terabyte, maybe one terabyte of DRAM, which is very expensive. Uh, with this kind of product that we will be releasing, uh, we can get up to three terabytes of non-volatile memory. That is uh, of the similar endurance to the DRAM, so we don't worry that it wears off like the regular flash drives and with the similar uh, latencies, so we can use it pretty much as a DRAM, which is kind of interesting. Um, how we have approached this problem? On one hand, we have hardware that is evolving, right, the materials and so on. On the other, it's software. We need software to utilize the hardware. We need software to uh, make programming easier for everyone and actually make the product success. So a couple of years ago, uh, Sinia has opened the, a working group around non-volatile programming, and they came up with the uh, programming model, which is standardized by Sinia. And this is the base of uh, all of our implementations. And uh, programming model is, on one hand side, complicated. On one hand side, it's pretty straightforward. But it gives you a couple of options. So uh, basically, when we have the hardware, we have the driver on top of it. And the driver uh, can expose the device as a uh, raw access characteristic device. It can expose it as a block device to the file system and have regular file system on top of it and use it as a disk. Uh, but we have also a path here that I will talk a bit later that gives you actually the direct mapping uh, for your application, direct mapping of the addresses here. So when you have here the 
system physical addresses. Uh, we put on top of uh, on top of regular file system extensions. These are DAX direct access extensions um, that when file put over here gets memory mapped, we get uh, direct mapping uh, from the virtual address space of your process through the page tables uh, to the system physical address on the NVD. We don't have page cache. So uh, it allows for a direct load store operations from your application. And that's the fastest way to go, actually, to the NVDM. Um, it omits all the kernel space. It's a direct user space operation, right? So we don't touch kernel at all. We don't touch file system. So basically, entire uh, uh, maintenance of the maintaining of the uh, data here and all the bookkeeping around it needs to be handled by your applications, which is quite complicated. Uh, so. We'll get back to this model a bit, uh, on and on, um, but this is the, the basics of uh, what we are talking about. Um, so how does this uh, hardware look for the to the operating system? So at first we have the ACPI and feed tables, which are standardized, and by what is exposed to the kernel, we can see already some of the capabilities so we have uh, basic the uh, system physical address ranges uh, exposed. We have additionally information about interleaf structures because we have uh, interleaving, right? This is regular memory controller. It has DIMMs. It can interleave uh, the ranges. It has also some block structure uh, control regions to utilize to allow you to, to use it as a block storage to provide atomicity on a block level. And how does it look in the Linux when you launch your machine, uh, launch kernel? Uh, you can see in the DMESC, uh, this is the memory map, E820, and there are regions here that are presented as a non-volatile DIMMs, so this is a persistent type of the memory, their type may differ. But we have regular memory ranges, with an exception that those are actually reserved. It's not said here, but uh, those are not directly usable by, um, by your kernel or applications. The, these are not visible. Uh, these are visible to the driver and exposed by the driver. So the driver needs to do something with it, and what it does, it exposes as a device, right? Block device mostly. And when we have a block device like this, what can we do with it? So looking at it, that we have a huge capacity of DRAM-like thing plugged in. We can use it as a memory. We might not care about the persistency of the data. We might have some temporal, big, sparse matrices that we want to just put it, it, put it in, calculate something on it, and then dump it. We don't care about it. So the first uh, usage model is just to use it as a memory. And uh, for this, we actually have also a couple of approaches. Uh, we actually couldn't do it in a straightforward way that uh, with the E820 memory map table, uh, you could imagine, OK, let's not put it as a reserved, but as a regular memory. And so application can see it, can allocate within the space. Problem with it is it's actually um, differs with the parameters. So you want to have some differentiation between uh, a bit faster DRAM, this memory, maybe high bandwidth memory. And you would lose this data. You could think about the NUMA nodes behind it, but it's a hacky thing to, to, to do in this context. So uh, what we have done is, uh, um, based on the SNIA programming model, which is file-based, so as a user, you have a regular file system, you create a file, you memory map it, and then you do within the address range of this file whatever you want. And for this case, we are only allocating objects when the program terminates. 
we kill the file. Or when the machine crashes, next time program starts, it kills the file. And also, a couple of approaches here. We have uh, some libraries written for it. Uh, the first one, uh, libvmalloc actually uh, replaces uh, during the compile time all your malloc calls to the ones that we provide, and all your allocations goes to persistent memory, which is a bit slower than working on the DRAM, but maybe this is what you want. It's the easiest way to, uh, to deploy, actually, because it requires no changes to the application. Um, a bit more complicated is when you want to actually tune your application and have some of the data put on the DRAM and some on the persistent memory, uh, which can give you some advantages, but you need to change your application, of course. And you have then separate APIs to allocate the memory. Another one, which is very similar to the previous, is the memkind library, which is also open source. All of this is open source, of course. And um, this one is made actually from the high performance computing world, where the guys have on Xeon Phi machines high bandwidth memory, which they want to, dif this is on, on die memory. And they want to differentiate. Okay, for some allocations, we want this super uh, high bandwidth memory on some regular DRAM, on some non-volatile DRAM. And their applications are actually tuned to use it like this. So you, you put the kind of your memory size and the algorithms take care of the rest. Uh, so this is volatile usage. The next one would be the easy way block storage. You've seen the, in the ACPI NFIT, there are some structures that uh, allow hardware to handle the block atomicity. You can also do it on the software side, with the driver. Within our library, we have also so support for block storage. It has one huge advantage because it doesn't require your application to change at all. Right? It operates on files. It's still operating on files in the same manner. And we guarantee the same consistency of the data within the files. Uh, the drawback of the block storage is this. This is the storage stack diagram for Linux. Right, so I won't go through it because it's not my domain. But uh, when you're working with the files, each time you want to change something, update, you need to go somewhere through the stack, which costs you time and which also costs you CPU cycles. Uh, it didn't matter so far that much because we were working on the uh, relatively slow mediums, SSDs is most popular now, but it's still slow comparing to the NVRAM. So uh, it's usable, but not really the point of interest to, to me at least. So the, the most interesting thing is to actually use all that medium gives us, is, which is the byte persistency. So we have uh, this uh, DIMM hardware, which is byte addressable, right? This is very important. So this is not covered in the, it's not split in the blocks, it's byte addressable, and it's persistent. And uh, to actually use it, there are a couple of things that we need to remember, that we need to address. So. Um, to make the data persistent, we need, to, we need to have this data go through the medium. Normally, when we operate on some data, it stays in the registers of the CPU, in the caches, and uh, it goes to the underlying storage or RAM when the time comes, right? So CPU basically on its own manages it, the, the cache rotation. Uh, in this case, uh, we want to make sure that when we update something, we want it already to be safe. And to do it, we need to have some sort of uh, cache flash instruction that we invoke. So there's, those are the examples that we can use. And uh, caches of the processor is one thing. The second one is also memory controller itself. It has its own buffers. We need to make sure they are 
of the data as well. And only when we are the, with this deem, nvdeem, uh, power failure save domain, then we are good to go, right? We can be sure that when next time we restart something system after crash or whatever, the data will be there. So this is fairly easy problem to be solved. The next one is the atomicity. So uh, what we have with the regular programming, uh, with the uh, flashes to the drives, memory mapped files, uh, we basically copy some uh, data, then we invoke msync, mdatasync, or, or something like this, and the data is persistent on the drive. With the, our libraries that I will talk a bit later, we have additional, we have replaced the call to the msync with our own, which does this cache flashing in a proper manner, proper order, with proper fencing. And it works. Like with this example, it will work. We're safe. What happens when we have a complex structure like Hello World? And when we are flashing the caches, uh, we have a power failure. What will be the outcome? Any ideas? All IDs are good, right? We don't know. Because with the ordering that can change of the instructions, because, uh, and uh, with uh, power failure that can happen before any cache happened, after all, after partially um, flashed, cached, we have no clue what will be the outcome. And this outcome is already stored. And next time when our application starts up, we will expect that this data is valid. We have no ways to actually determine that the data is invalid. We would need to store additional tons of uh, um, metadata to check whether the data has been set or not, which would be complex and not easy. So this is the, the second one. And this is only for a singular object. We, can, we will be also talking a lot around, um, um, uh, with, uh, around transactions. So how to give to the software developers, software programmers, uh, tools to have transaction support on the NVDM. And my friend Tomek will be talking later on, on concepts around it. The, the third challenge that we have is um, around positioning of the data. So we have files, right? So we open the application, we give it a file handle, and then let application decide where to put its objects on the file. It's a lot of work, actually, because this is a malloc operation, right? When we memory map a file to have this direct path, um, we have only the entry point. We have entry address, and we can use SBRK call to navigate through it. We don't have a regular malloc function. And this is something that we um, need to provide in some sort of the library, because I cannot see any, uh, all of the application developers to actually develop their own mallocs. Uh, some handling around the files. Um, joining those files because application grows, you want to allocate more data. Okay, what now? We give a second file, create it, right? We want uh, maybe a contiguous address space within the application, right? We need to handle this. Uh, and every pointer that we allocate, so every result of allocation API is actually a persistent pointer. So when you run your application on DRAM, uh, all you care about, you, you're doing a malloc call, you give, uh, you're getting an address, and next time you run your application, this address will be for sure different. Or oh, not always, but uh, pretty certain. And in this case, it's actually on the contrary. You want this address to be the same because the data is already there. It cannot change, right? And this is a persistent pointer, which uh, gives us problems like fragmentation, right? We are allocating within this file all the time. We are freeing resources. 
and we cannot defragment the data. It needs to stay where it was originally. So there is um, a lot of challenges to actually make it work for the applications in a good way. Uh, and those challenges are addressed by the applications that we are um, open sourcing, so it's actually already uh, in the production quality, it's included in some of the distributions, like Suzy and Fedora, and others, I believe. Uh, and as far as I know, this is the only incarnation that is uh, of library like this, which is in the production quality. So there are some other approaches to the persistent memory programming and incarnations of this persistent memory programming model, but this is production quality already. Fully open source, GitHub, welcome to take a look. Uh, there is actually, um, it's not a single library, it's a set of the libraries. So we have a support for the basic persistency handling, like this flashing in the proper order, detecting whether we are working on a non-volatile memory, or maybe the file that was given as a start point is regular SSD, right? We can work with this as well, right? We will just invoke m -Sync. It's not a problem. Uh, the most uh, important and base one is the libpmm opt, which gives you transactional object store, which is, um, for me as an application architect, uh, the most important thing. Mm, some management of the pools with the libpmm pool, replication, basic replication functionality that we are working uh, so f um, still on. And it's pretty well documented. We have uh, plenty of blog posts that describe the basic functionalities. Now, let's, let's go to the clue, the, the applications, because this is something that, uh, that I'm working on. And what do we want to, how do we want to modify our application? Uh, we can take a look at the allocation. So, our data, whether it's temporal data, whether it's our storage within applications, uh, where to put it? Do we know where to put it? Sometimes we know, sometimes not. It's the decision that, as an application architect, we need to understand how it works, where is actually the bottleneck of the application, where we want the data to, uh, to be processed faster or slower. Uh, does all of the data needs to be persistent? For sure not, right? But still, we can put it on a persistent memory because it's huge. And maybe we want our uh, temporary data, uh, which is huge, to be still faster than the paged one uh, through the swap. And uh, when to guarantee persistence? It's also a big question, right? Whether uh, which every storage of the, which, with every update, update of the object, do we need to flash everything or not? It needs some thinking around it. And uh, the, but this was the easy part, the storage. Then we have the application engine itself. So. Uh, question whether we want our application to resume after failure. It might be application failure, it might be system crash, kernel panic, it might be power failure, right? Do we actually want to resume it? Depends, right? This is actually a good use case for the high performance computing where you have big chunks of the data that requires a couple of hours for computation. Then it could be actually quite beneficial to introduce some resume operation, right? And they are doing it through the checkpointing, which takes a lot of time. If we put all this data on the persistent memory, then this time is cut off. And let's take on um, how complicated it is. So this is some pseudocode. Don't, don't look at the, uh, whether it should run or not. Uh, we have some iterative calculations that run over some iterations. 
And uh, when we want to shift it to the persistent memory, it's okay, let's move it all. Uh, at first, what we notice is that actually this iterator cannot be zeroed in this uh, loop. We need to zero it at the first runtime of the application, but only at first, right? Because next time we run it, it might be after a crash, and we need to detect whether it was running before or not, and zero it afterwards or not. Uh, then it gets simple, right? You use some, um, this is actually our uh, transactional macros that gives you transactional allocations of this. You put the singular iteration in the transactional part of the code, and then after everything is finished, uh, you zero your iterator. Who thinks that this will work? Can you raise your hands? Will this work? Or maybe someone sees a flaw here. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Very nice. So the flow is here. The increment, the iterator is not persistent, right? So when we have a crash over here in the code, more or less, right? Then we have already results updated with, for this iteration, but iterator is not. So we are calculating next time, second time. And when we put actually the clause for the transaction all over here, it doesn't make sense anymore because uh, we don't have resume. Right. So it actually requires a lot of architectural thinking, even on the small pieces of the code, to have uh, the best out of the persistent memory. And I have some examples on um, what we have done with it, uh, and what kind of benefits we can actually um, expect. So the first thing we have uh, looked at is this in-memory database, it's not a database, it's key value store. I think everyone knows Redis more or less. It's quite simple. And we thought that, okay, um, since we have this large memory, it's the most compelling use case to have in-memory database and use persistent memory. Uh, one note here, right? This is all on some developer machines, so it's not real hardware because we haven't announced the performance results yet from the real hardware, so all the values here are relative. So around the benefits, and the, this Redis is actually open source as well on our GitHub. There's not actually, we have two versions of Redis changes to within it. Uh, the obvious advantage is startup time. Uh, so when we put all the data to persistent memory and work with it directly, we don't have any memory copy, we don't have any loading from the disk to the memory, the startup is uh, instant. And we can see that it's actually not, right? It's one second. Uh, let me shortly explain the other modes. The RDB is the... Mm, this uh, Redis is the in-memory database, but it has also persistency modes too, RDB and AOF. RDB is snapshot, which is taken once a second at, uh, at highest frequency, and AOF is append only file, this is journaling, and uh, which is configured here to work uh, like every update. And PM, persistent memory. So, with the native persistency modes from Redis that we are loading all the data from NVMe drive here in this case, so we are working with the NVMe fastest on the market, we still get on this relatively small pieces of data, like 20, 30 seconds, and we've heard yesterday, I think, that it takes even hours for the large data sets. And with persistent memory, we are thinking of large data sets like a couple of terabytes, right? So it's quite compelling to have this down to zero. Uh, why we don't have zero? It's our choice. So this is the architectural choice to actually leave the dictionary in RAM, and this one second is uh, due to rebuilding this dictionary, putting it into RAM from the persistent memory data. We could also put this dictionary in persistent memory, and have it uh, really zero. Right? But this is our choice. If you would 
shifted to the persistent memory, the Redis operation overall would be a bit slower, but startup time is zero, right? So this is your choice. Um, the other straightforward one is DRAM usage. We are not using it at all, right? So uh, with all those slides um, on the horizontal axis, you have uh, object di um, different object sizes, but we have the same number of objects. So this is uh, half a mil objects. Uh, with the differentiating sizes, and so we have uh, like six, seven gigabytes of RAM allocated for the data plus metadata uh, in DRAM with Redis operational and with persistent memory. All of it is actually on persistent memory, only dictionaries in RAM, and it's not visible because it's like 10 megabytes. So you can basically cut the DRAM from your machine more or less. Um, now let's see at the, the ones that are more, um, more useful, but not that easy to see. What happens when you're operating Redis or any other application and your data size exceeds the physical size of your RAM on the machine? You're hitting swap, unless you configure not to, but normally you're hitting swap. And it basically kills the Redis when you do it. The performance drops to zero, close to zero, with the original. So this is the original version of Redis. Uh, when you're actually doing the snapshotting, you're dying at half of the RAM, because snapshotting is fork, copy on the right, you need double of this memory. And this is all the, uh, all the update operations. So we are uh, all of those data, data is from the update operations. It's not mixed, get something. It's, it's the worst case scenario, all updates. So you die sooner. Uh, with the journaling, it's a bit better, but it's um, still not that good. The problem behind it, when you're running the application in an environment like a DevOps, is it's very hard to detect it, right? It's very hard to detect how much data can I actually allocate more on my Redis instance before it dies? Right? You need to literally turn off swap and look for the errors with the allocator, which will kill your Redis probably. And with persistent memory, we don't have it. We, have, we don't use RAM, so we don't have this problem. When we run out of the persistent memory, the allocator from the library will tell you um, that uh, it couldn't allocate your new object or change it, and then you're pretty much safe to go. Right? You can handle it far much easier. Uh, the drop you can see here, don't worry about it, this is the, those results. So actually this chart is quite complicated to generate, and to run. it involves a lot of handwork. And we have done it like in December when we are still in beta, beta version of NVML. And uh, right now we, are, we have changed some allocator uh, bugs and we are more flat here. So similar performance. But to the performance, because right now we can see some uh, snapshot of the performance. The performance we can best see with uh, uh, with the IOPS, with the updates per second that we can actually get out of Redis. And uh, we will compare only two modes, right? This one is the, the persistent memory operation only, and the second is this journaling. Because uh, when you configure Redis to work in the snapshot, um, the highest frequency of the snapshot is one second, which means that actually when power failure comes, you lose some data, always. Right, there is no way around it. You lose like 100,000 of your data updates up to on this machine. So it's not really comparable to persistent memory because persistent memory gives you full consistency of the data, which is also giving you this uh, append only file journaling with the option turned to one. After each update, file gets updated, everything gets called. And Persistent uh, performance is actually pretty comparable, as you can see. It's more or less the same, we could say, right, on this emulated environment, at least. Uh, 
so is it better in this case? Hard to say, right? Maybe. Probably yes, because you have larger capacity of persistent memory, and for Redis you still need a large, large uh, chunk of RAM. But uh, what happens when we actually stuff the machine further? So this 1x, so uh, the, the first two charts means that there is one process of Redis which gets updates. And what happens when we get to the same socket, same CPU, uh, more data? So we launch on the same socket four instances of Redis and make each one of them receive the same amount of updates as much as it can consume. With persistent memory, we're flat with the performance. And this is performance per instance. And with the journaling, you can see a lot of drop. Right? And why is it? Because with journaling, you need to go through the file system. Right? You have F-Sync, and each update goes through the kernel and goes to the disk. Uh, going further, we can see that we drop on this machine around uh, eight instances, six, eight, because this is eight core machine. Uh, so the, the last one we took with, uh, is 10 instances, and then we are off around 15 times faster in overall operation, right? Of a singular Redis instance. Um, which means that basically when you run on persistent memory, you save a lot of CPU time, maybe for other databases you have, maybe for the more complicated one, or some other applications, VMs, that you can run on the same machine. The same chart. So this chart, if we represent it in the total data throughput, so multiply those 10 instances by the number of operations that we can get and by the data, what we can see easily is that with this NVMe drive operating under Redis on this machine, we get a cutoff of around here less than 200 megabytes per second of real data updates in key value store. So this is not the uh, FIO operations, pure data transfer. This is real logic behind the database. And with persistent memory, we don't have that cutoff. It's probably somewhere there with the bandwidth of the medium, but we are not using CPU that much, so it doesn't limit us. This is the, the actual CPU cutoff, which gives you a lot more power for your applications. Uh, maybe the second example, we have still uh, some time, so we can go through the second example. This is the uh, HPC world, again, this is a MAT library, uh, which is also open sourced, and it, uh, it's widely used as an algorithm to some computations. And one what we have uh, taken is the operation on the sparse matrices. So uh, it's quite interesting because sparse matrix is a huge, uh, a huge amount of data. It's then compressed, so it doesn't take overall that much space, but it can, right? And it's used everywhere. It's finite element uh, calculations, all of the engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, climate. It's used everywhere, right? So um, we have changed this algorithm to work with the persistent memory, and what we can see, right? We weren't expecting much because, okay, we are changing the load times to zero, which is visible, oh, sorry, visible here, right? But the, if you look at it, the load time takes only three seconds, right? And we are changing it to, uh, I'm sorry, not here. It takes 1.6 seconds and we are changing it to zero or close to zero. Uh, but the calculations, we are expecting, okay, we are working out of the persistent memory, we will need a bit more. But it's not that bad. Actually, most of the time is spent on the CPU calculations within caches. So computation is only around 2% slower. So overall, we do not notice uh, a large drawback of using persistent memory. Uh, but we don't need any DRAM, which is a good thing because um, we can actually process a larger 
data matrices and uh, on the singular node. Um, mm, problem behind this is actually a lot of work to make algorithms shift to the persistent memory. The second example we have, which gives you a bit more around the architectural decisions, as the solver of sparse matrices. So this was previously was simple multiplication. Now we have a solver. And the original implementation, this is a C++, takes less than 50 seconds and consumes uh, half a gig of memory, DRAM memory. Uh, when we shift, uh, decided to change it, OK, gradually, let's shift first the data uh, to the persistent memory and leave all the temporal data or the computations still in DRAM. Uh, we get this small drawback, it's still less than 50 seconds, uh, but the DRAM occupations dropped in half. It shows us that our data is actually input output data is um, half of the DRAM which is used for the temporal stores. And the third approach is to shift everything, right? So to go deep into the algorithms and have all the allocations made for the persistent memory. And this already you can notify that, uh, uh, you can notice that uh, it gives you some performance drawback. So it's like 50% slower than operations on the RAM or the mixed mode. Uh, but then your DRAM um, requirement has dropped to zero or close to zero. So this is um, this involves a programming persistent memory involves a lot of architectural decisions, a lot of rethinking on how your applications work, right? Whether it will actually have some benefits, for sure it will, right? But is it uh, real to make? that vast changes, right? Or maybe start it slow. You can start it slow, right? Shift some of the data. There is no universal recipe for this. Uh, you can approach it from uh, different ways, and there is a lot of work for the architects. So not only the software developers, uh, but for the people that understand all the operations of the, of the applications and what is actually the market requirement behind it. But for the developers, there's huge amount of coding, right? But it's fun, <laughs> right? And we have plenty of topics yet that needs to be addressed, that are addressed right now, work in progress, because persistent memory in a form, use, easily, widely usable form is a new thing, right? It will require plenty of time for adoption, right? The programming mm, paradigms have not changed since decades, I can say, right? So only what we have experienced from the market is having faster drives, faster memory, faster CPUs, or maybe we have uh, a big change with the number of cores growing, right? But from the storage mode, not really, right? And this involves a lot of changes for the applications and rethinking it, which is a nice thing. And probably, we are hoping that this will revolutionize actually the computing that we have right now. Thank you. That's it from the side. So we we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. There's a mic if you can hear. Uh, thanks. Uh, I want to know if um, we want to use this this persistent memory or uh, other architecture like uh, ARM or PPC. So, what kind of hardware change we needed? Yeah. Uh, so, can we use it on uh, different architectures, not only x86? So, as a Intel company, right, we are focused on x86, x but uh, others are surely possible. Right. What we have done uh, from the instruction uh, set architecture that uh, was introduced to support this 
is actually optimized cache flushing. So it depends how PowerPC or ARM deals with the caches and what it, uh, how it um, allows for the user to flush all the caches to the medium. So this is one thing you need to think about. Uh, the second one is this memory controller. We, had, we actually had a separate instructions to flash the buffers from the memory controller, uh, which was actually deprecated before it hit the, the market, hit the real hardware, because we decided, okay, we have also motherboard feature to deal with, with this uh, challenge. So those are only those two things, right? It's not much. So, is there any uh, research on the other architectures' usage? Mm. Hmm? Is, um, is there any research or is there some preparation uh, that is working on? Uh, uh, I think so. So, I haven't actually dig deep to see any other architecture using it. Uh, one thing we can see is um, when we have our library that um, gives you this programming model, we have Google Groups behind it, and there are questions, right? So like, just like yesterday or today, we had a question, okay, I tried to run it on the PowerPC and it doesn't work because it doesn't have those instructions, right? CPU instructions and how we can assist. So those questions are starting to pop up, right? I think it was, there was also something from ARM a couple of months ago, but I'm not sure. So people are actually looking through it. Oh, okay, last question. Um, it's currently, is some of the I guess some of the CPU should should uh, can use this um, persistent memory, but some of them may not. So, can you give, give me a list about uh, what type of CPU ca currently can support the, the persistent memory? Uh, so, for the matrix, which CPUs can support persistent memory? You need to actually go to the marketing guys, right? They have all the matrices. And uh, for the current persistent memory, I think the, that it's on the market, right? This NVDIM type F or type N. Uh, most should be able to use it, which supports ADR uh, platform um, feature. Uh, for the ones that are based on the 3D cross points, uh, we haven't yet announced it, right? So it's not publicly disclosed. Okay, thanks. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Ah, yes. I wonder, would, would it be possible through the memory controller to declare the, the RAM as non-cached? And would I, in that case, not have to do the flush? Uh, yes, it's possible to not use cache at all, right? And it's, uh, in some cases, we are doing it. We are, for example, uh, pushing all the data through the non terpolar stores, right, this AVX instructions to make it faster. But normally when the uh, CPU computes the data, it always uses cache, mm. right? It's, the, uh, the DIM itself doesn't need the flash instruction, it's just the cache. Yeah, and, and the current architecture of the x86, mm. I don't think it's possible. <laughs> Maybe other, right? Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you.